nearly 400 years ago, a text was published which promised the knowledge of causes and secret motions of things and the enlarging of the bounds of human empire to the effecting of all things possible. The text was Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, the first scientific utopia of the modern age, and its format may have reminded its readers of Thomas More's earlier political utopia, but Bacon's text included something new, that is, depictions of scientific wonders, among which intimations of the telephone or the airplane. The West was still dreaming about such things at the end of the 19th century, and the 20th century imagination still built its own utopias around them. But the thrill of the new machines was not the whole story. Bacon's grand plan was also about reforming the ways of learning, teaching, and above all, discovering. This meant going beyond the familiar boundaries of knowledge, or as he put it, crossing the Gibraltar of the mind. Yes, that narrow strait between southern Spain and northern Africa, where the two rocky shores were taken to represent the legendary Pillars of Hercules, signalling the physical limits of the known world, beyond which one would venture at once peril. Going beyond the Pillars of Hercules was the heroic attempt of modern geographical explorers, and Bacon saw himself as just such an explorer, yet this time of the oceans and continents of knowledge, the world of the intellect, or the mundus intellectualis. This was the grand plan of the reformation of learning that shaped the face of our early modernity, and it led, among other things, to the establishment of the first scientific academy of the modern world, the Royal Society of London. And yet for Bacon, as for many of his contemporaries, the mind of man, its intellectual, imaginative and emotional capacities, was a sorry prospect, the reason really why the world was plunged in crisis. The time was one of crisis, in many ways resembling our own, political and religious wars, overturning of traditional knowledge, and uncertainty about the criteria of truth. Bacon's contemporary Robert Burton captured the spirit of the times in a book he entitled The Anatomy of Melancholy. But Bacon also talks about the need to cleanse and order our minds as the necessary counterpart to the advancement of learning, and that's because humans are, as a rule, fools who think they are geniuses. It's a lie! His theory of the idols of the human mind still sounds very much relevant today. It says we are lazy, superficial, opinionated thinkers who are afraid to have our ideas tested, however unfounded or contested they may be. We're eager to proclaim certainty based on little evidence and to force others to think the way we do. We don't know how to listen, we don't know how to teach, and we don't know how to learn. So from this point of view, things didn't look that promising or at least not that triumphant. To turn the human mind around was, and remains, a Herculean task indeed. How widespread was this discourse about human folly in the early modern period? What were its sources and its context, and how resonant is it with today's views of human capacities? Are we still asking questions about the connections between the pursuit of knowledge and the moral reform of the mind? Further, was the rhetoric of novelty and progress attached to the new science of the early modern period accepted on all fronts? How was the war between old and new, ancients and moderns fought? Explore these questions and more at the British Cultural Studies MA program of the University of Bucharest.